Hey Burnett, well, welcome to Church Online for this week. Really glad that you found your way here. We know that some of you are still uh, making your way back to church uh, in real life. And some of you are just uh, out and about this week enjoying uh, what the summer has to offer. Whatever your case, we're really glad that you're here. Uh, we're gonna continue with our sermon series today called On Mission, as we discuss what exactly that mission is and how do we determine what kinds of things God might be calling us to do in the world around us. So stay tuned for that. We'll have some worship first. And before we get all to that, I'd like to pray with you. So let's, uh, let's bow together and connect with God. Heavenly Father, thank you for this good day. Thank you for the summer and all that it holds for us. Thank you for your continued provision for our province and the others when it comes to uh, kind of uh, getting through this pandemic. Uh, God, thank you for the wisdom that you've given the, the leaders who continue to guide your people and guide our country. Uh, we thank you that, uh, that today we have the chance to hear and make the gospel known by the beauty of technology and ask that you would be with us as we open our hearts to you and ask you again to speak to us, to guide us, to help us along the journey and for us to be a part of what you're doing in the world, uh, making our lives bigger and more significant and more meaningful than they would be without you. We are so grateful that you love us enough to come and commune with your people. And so we invite you to speak, uh, to have your way in our hearts today, we pray in Jesus name, amen.
It was my cross you bore So I could live in the freedom you died for And now my life is yours And I will sing of your goodness forevermore
Well, just one announcement for everybody this week, uh, not to sound like a broken record, but it is one we've made a couple times now. We're starting to ramp up and get ready for our fall ministry schedule, which means that we need people to get involved again. Um, I know it's been a while and there's been this long break with the pandemic, but life is ramping up. And so to help it not just be square pegs and round holes or every warm body, we've set up a way for you to get connected on the website to uh, some assessments, some discipleship tools uh, that will make this a, a more robust and meaningful process maybe than in the past. Um, a few people have asked, does everybody need to do this? Like I was doing this before the pandemic. Yeah, we would like everybody to do it. Our intention is to have everyone uh, to uh, learn a little bit about your spiritual gifts, learn a little bit about your strengths, let one of our pastors or staff members have a conversation with you um, before we get everybody plugged back in. So if you surf on over to our website, burnettchurch.com um, and look for the Serve at Burnett uh, tab, you'll be able to get connected. For those of you who have already filled it out, thank you so much. Teresa was on vacation last week, so we are still connecting with all of you in terms of getting those assessments out. Should be happening really, really soon if you haven't gotten the email already. As always, we would encourage you to stay connected with us through our different social media channels. Facebook and Instagram are kind of our two big ones right now. Uh, and so if you're not following us there, we would encourage you to do so. I am pretty sure that Eric's gonna put the connection information just below me as I speak. So thanks again, everyone, and we'll talk again soon. Listen, I wanted to take a quick second to, uh, to pray before we dive into the message. Um, because over the last couple of weeks, sometimes I think we, we pray and we pray for the things that are going wrong and we don't stop to remember the things that God's doing because we pray. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like, man, I, 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 we hear all these prayer requests, but we don't always hear the, the positive report. I want you to know that in the last couple of weeks, we were praying for somebody with cancer and they've been made cancer free. I want you to know that in the last couple of weeks we were praying for somebody who had a family member in a coma on life support who should be taken off life support and that family prayed and they waited and that family member has come out of their coma and that family member is talking and moving and this was not supposed to happen because people prayed for that person. Guys, we were praying for somebody this week who had a heart procedure, and the heart procedure went well. I mean, there's just so much to give God thanks and praise for. And I want you to know that we believe that prayer works, that it's important, that it's not something we tack on to life, you know, to make us feel like God's moving, but because the scriptures ask us to pray, we pray, and because we pray, God moves. Amen? Amen. 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 I want you to know, by the way, that there's a group of people who meet here every Sunday morning before the service to pray. And if you ever feel like you want to join them, I know that the door is wide open. I meet right now just in the fireside room together. Um, and you could talk to uh, Chris or Jane or email the office if you have any questions about that. But for right now, just let's pray. Will you bow with me? If you want to stand, you can stand. If you want to sit, you can sit. However you feel at this moment. But let's pray together. God, we are so grateful. So grateful for the goodness that you are doing that it is no small thing for us to say God makes promises and he keeps them. That God is a miracle worker. That when God says he'll make a way, he does it again and again and again. That none of these things are things of just the past, but we can expect you to move in mighty ways in our future. And God, we want to be a people who see again and again the work of God in the world around us. So teach us Teach us what you want from us. Teach us how to be the people you want to work through. Teach us how to be true worshipers in spirit and truth. God, be with us and teach us this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, listen, today we're going to continue our uh, series called On Mission. We started last week and we considered this question, why does God have a mission? And I mean, maybe the answer was really obvious. God is love, so God loves, so he sends, and he sends because he wants good for our lives. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the what. Maybe this is what you would expect us to start with. And a couple weeks ago, 
when we did the Meet the Pastor Sunday, Amy asked me a question that I just kind of want to reiterate my answer to. She asked me, what's your favorite Bible story? And I said, actually, I don't have a favorite Bible story. The thing that I've been really obsessed with over the last couple of years is that the story of Scripture is coherent, that the entirety of this book tells a story. Now, I want to be clear about something. When I say that the entirety of this book tells a story, I don't mean that huge swaths of it are untrue or anything like that. I'm, I'm not, that's not the assertion I'm making. What I'm making is that God, in telling us what he wants us to know, from beginning to end, there is a story arc told in scriptures that I think we need to know, and I think it's important because I think it directly speaks to what God is doing in the world. To set this up, I just want to pick on my mom and dad for a minute because they're here. Um, and if you're a member of a pastor's family and you show up and they're speaking, then, uh, then you get picked on. Um, don't worry if you're new here. We don't pick on new people, just my mom and dad. Um, because I spent years listening to my dad preach and being the example in so many sermons, I can't imagine. My old pastor in Ontario, he paid his kids five bucks every time we talked about them in the sermon. I'd be a rich man if my dad had given me five dollars every time he used me in a sermon. So this morning, it's family story time, and maybe you heard me say before that the Hear About family loves a good road trip. I'm not going to tell you exactly that same story, but I am going to tell you a road trip story. In 1994, the Hearabouts went on a road trip, and the point of what I'm about to say is that, look, there are details in stories that if you just tell the bare minimum of the story, you miss so much of the entertainment. So the bare minimum of this story is, in 1994, the Hirabo family went on a trip to Ottawa, Ontario. Okay, not a very interesting story. Cool story, bro. Move on. Okay, let me tell you some more about it. In 1994, we got in a late model Dodge Caravan. You know, one of the ones with the wood panels on the side from the 80s? You know, the ones that you always see on the back of tow trucks? Like, we got in one of those and we left Nova Scotia to go to uh, Ottawa. And on our way, we stopped in Edmonston, New Brunswick. Now, if you've ever done this trip, and most of you probably haven't, but let me give you a little geographical lesson. You go from Nova Scotia kind of up through New Brunswick to the very top, and there's Edmonston right on the border between New Brunswick and Quebec. And so most people stop in Edmonston kind of as they make their way into Quebec. So we stop. We're going to spend the night. We get a room at a motel. We're a family of four on a pastor's lifestyle. And so we stayed at a motel, not a fancy hotel or anything like that. You know, a motel, it's on the side of the highway. And so on the side of the highway, this motel has no air conditioning. By the way, it's June 30th, so it's like getting up to in the Maritimes, we're starting to talk about heat. There's no air conditioning. And it is literally next to the Trans-Canada Highway. Like, there's no barrier between the parking lot of the motel and the Trans-Canada. So all night long, Trucks, exactly. Who made the noise? <laughs> air brakes. There's no signs. It's like, please don't use your air brakes. No, no, no. All that stuff is going on. And so here are the hereabouts. I'm 14. My sister's 10. We can't share a bed. I'm on the floor. Mom and dad are in the bed next to my sister, and none of us are sleeping because it's hot and sticky and sweaty and noisy. And so at some ungodly hour of the morning, my dad has had enough. And he wakes us all up, not that we weren't already up, he gets us all up out of bed and says, okay, that's it, we're going to Ottawa. So we get in the car, the minivan, and we proceed down the highway. Now in short order, because nobody slept, the lull of the tires puts my sister and mom asleep in the back. I'm in the front of my discman, holding it perilously so that it doesn't skip. <laughs> my head down, just like focused on don't you dare skip. And dad's driving. And suddenly I look up, it must have been a break in the music or something, or maybe it was just the Lord speaking to me. I look up and the van is going shh across the highway. And I look over and dad is <laughs> He's asleep. And so over my headphones, I yell at the top of my life, Dad, wake up! And he wakes up and he spins the wheel and we avoid the ditch and we pull off and we take about 30 minutes for our heart rate to come down below dangerous levels but there's more. <laughs> then we kept driving. And remember I said it was in a Dodge Caravan, and you've never seen a Dodge Caravan that wasn't on the back of a tow truck, and this was true of this Dodge Caravan. So it is now Canada Day, and we're in the middle of French-speaking Quebec. 
and the transmission goes and the van stops and we're on the side of the highway and so dad and I have to get out and jump a fence because there's a farmhouse over yonder like this we're in rural Quebec just outside Drummondville but we're still in a rural part of Quebec so we go over and we knock on the door so I'm in grade 8 at this point and I am the best French speaking person in the family by a country mile so I'm trying to ask these folks if we can use their telephone and they're like, we don't speak English. Because they probably thought we were there to murder them or rob them or something. You know, like two men show up at the, you know, it's generous of me to call myself a man at 14 years old. But anyway, two guys show up at the door. I'm trying to speak French. I'm really terrible at it. My dad is trying to communicate. And the way I remember it, I'm sure he didn't do this, but the way I remember it is that he was trying to describe the fact that the engine seized. And so he's making piston noise, like, like motions at the front door. This is how I, I, again, I don't know if that's actually true, but it's really funny, so I remember it that way. And these people are just like, they insist for probably 20 minutes that they don't speak English. And then all of a sudden they start speaking English. And then I think at that point they realize these guys probably aren't here to kill us or do anything nefarious. So they let us in, we use the phone. Like there's way more to that story I can tell, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna stop there. Because I think I made my point that the story is way more entertaining than we went to Ottawa in 1994. Right? I mean, the story is so much. We never even talk about the fact that we went to Ottawa. We talk about so many other things, all of that nonsense, the cottage we stayed at, and the dirty looks my cousin gave me when I caught the bigger fish than him. Like, there's so much more to that trip than we went to Ottawa in 1994. And guys, this morning as we think about what it is that God's mission is all about, here's the main point I want to make. I think a lot of the time when we talk about God's mission, we say that God's is to save people from hell. That's how we articulate the mission of God. And you know what? That is part of the mission of God. Absolutely, 100% part of the mission of God. However, it's not the entirety of it. And I think when we tell it like that, we miss so much more of what God wants to involve us in in the world. Our gospel is often too small because we take too many shortcuts and we try to get to an end that's incomplete. So we miss a lot of the beauty of what God is trying to do in the process. So what exactly is the entirety of the gospel? Well, it includes a lot of things that God sets up right at the very beginning of Scripture. This is the very first page of the Scriptures. Genesis, at least in this print size. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. It starts with what we talked about last week, that God, as Father, Son, and Spirit, has been enjoying this oneness, this beautiful love, that he suddenly gets inspired. Let's share it. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't it be amazing if we could create mankind in our image to know the love that we experience together? And so, in that moment, we are made to experience a oneness with God that is beautiful. If you continue reading, verse 28, God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I will give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds in the sky, and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I will give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made. And it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. God sets up not just a oneness with himself, but a oneness in the entirety of everything that he made. And so part of what God was inspired to do at the beginning was not just create a relationship between man and God, but to create a relationship 
between all of the creatures that he had made that was in harmony and beauty and oneness. He continues on. We have to skip a little bit. But he talks about how he has made man and woman. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found, so the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of man's ribs, and then he closed up the place. And the Lord God made a woman from the rib and took them out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Two really important things there. God makes man and woman to be a representative of the love of the Trinity in oneness and beauty. And if you can imagine for a quick second, it's really hard for us to do, that you look in the mirror and feel no shame when you don't have any clothes on. And so we made a oneness in and of ourselves. God did all four of these things in the beauty of creation. Before it was tainted by sin, before things were broken, God meant for us to have harmony with him, harmony with the world around us, harmony with the people we're in relationship with, and harmony in and of ourselves. Sin is first and foremost about broken relationships. So when man falls, what gets broken? Our relationship with God gets broken. We start pointing fingers, the woman made me do it. Our relationship with each other is broken. All of a sudden we have to cover ourselves because our relationship in and with ourselves is broken and shame enters the world. And God says, life's gonna be hard. And all of that that I wanted to give you, that eat freely thing, no, 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 you're gonna have to work for it. And all of a sudden, the relationship between everything is broken. And so mission, folks, mission is all about relationships. It is all about the restoration of God's plan for oneness. See, a lot of the time when we talk about the gospel, we say, you know, there was man and woman and they sinned, and then there was Jesus, and he came and he fixed sin, which he did, and then we move on, and we, like, we leave out the entirety of the Old Testament. When you talk about the gospel that way, you like miss two-thirds of the Bible. So what's the two-thirds of the Bible supposed to be about? It's supposed to be about the representation of how bad oneness can get without God's direction. How far apart can we drift without God's direction? To the point that God is working through Israel, and Israel tries over and over and over again to get it right their way. This is important. Their way. So that even at the very pinnacle of Israel's history, even when Solomon, the wisest man in the world, has been given everything by his father David, by all rights and purposes, the greatest era and greatest king that Israel ever had, Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes, everything is meaningless. Vanity, vanity, everything is vanity. Why? Because that oneness that God wanted is just not within human grasp. We are not able to fix it. And left to our own devices, as God allowed Israel to do again and again and again, oneness is not possible. There is only one solution to our oneness problem. One solution to all of those broken relationships. God himself and the love of God expressed in Jesus Christ is not just the solution for our problem of hell. It is our solution to the entire brokenness of everything that God created. One solution, perfect love in Jesus Christ. And suddenly oneness is possible, but there's only one way, only one truth, only one real life because of Jesus. Because God himself as he intended way back in that garden scenario, I'm going to give you oneness. That's what he wants for us, but we can't do it on our own. And if we continue to choose our own methods, if we continue to reject God's way, 
Oneness is not possible. Vanity, vanity, everything is vanity unless God fixes things. You know, the end of the biblical story is not our salvation. It's the restoration of the world. Go to the end of your, of your Bible and see that God plans to make for us a city where he rules his people. That is the end of the biblical story. It is the restoration, not just of our relationship with God, or even love God and love others. It is the restoration of all things in the created order under the lordship of Jesus. Because you know what? When the gospel is about the end of our salvation, we actually get the main character wrong. We make ourselves the main character in this story. We are not the main character in this story. God is the main character in this story. Because everything I just told you is a subplot. All that oneness stuff is a subplot. You know what the real plot is? There's a God who wants to be with his people as their king. Reject God's kingship and demand our own way. And so God makes concession to allow us to live in that for a while to go, okay, you think you know what you're doing? You don't. And then Jesus comes. And Jesus becomes king. Right? We, we fight for a kingdom invisible. And one day, that king is going to rule his people in a new heaven and a new earth. That's the major plot of the Bible. We make a mistake of putting ourselves at the center. It's so easy to do. We're human beings. Right? It's so easy. You ever have a conversation with somebody and you tell them a really good story and then they have to one-up your story? <laughs> now, I know none, nobody's ever out here. It's just like that. God tells us a great story. Oh, God, I want to be at the center of the story. So we make it about us. No, no, no. God's story cannot be one-upped, no matter how hard we try. We need the leadership and love of God through Jesus to help restore everything. The mission is bigger than just our salvation. So how does that affect the church? First, I think it focuses our attention by putting Jesus and God back at the center of the story. When people come here, they don't come for the music. They don't come for my preaching. Ultimately, what people really want is to know God, even if they don't know that themselves. I am convinced 100% the only thing the church has to offer is Jesus, 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 Jesus. Because there's a better show in town. Every time, doesn't matter how good, and our band is fantastic, like fantastic. I think I'm a mediocre preacher, but we have a fantastic band. There is a better show in town, even than these guys, every night of the week. It's not about a show. People come here and they come back for Jesus. And making the subplot, us and our stuff, is like saying that Star Wars is about Han and Leia. I'm going to be nerdy here for a minute, okay? Everybody knows I'm a nerd, right? Yeah. Or that the Lord of the Rings is about Aragorn and not Frodo. Or that Layla, my daughter, loves Marvel movies. Layla, is the Infinity Saga about Hulk or Tony Stark? Yeah. Tony Stark. It's not about the Hulk. Hulk has a great story. It's not about him. Guys, our attention... Always, like if we're doing ministries that you could do without speaking about Jesus, we're, we're, I'm not into that, honestly. Like what we do is introduce people to Jesus over and over and over again. Now there are lots of creative ways we can do that, but sometimes we do creative things and Jesus doesn't have to be a part of it for it to go well. And I think that we need to focus our attention always and ask ourselves, is Jesus at the center of the story we're telling? Second thing, it expands our horizons. Because all of a sudden, there's not just this one thing. You know, because I know lots of people say to me, but Tim, I'm not good at evangelizing people. And what they mean is I'm not good at speaking in such a way that people respond to the good news of Jesus. But that's not the only way you can be on mission. See, if God is about the restoration of all of those things, right? 
How all-encompassing and how inclusive is your sentness as a follower of Jesus? It literally touches every part of the world. He needs us to be in conversation in areas that the church typically thinks it's not our responsibility. The government's got that healthcare thing handled, or the government's got this handled, or those folks over there have this handled. No, I think exactly where you are, God has a mission for you, because his mission is so inclusive that I can say with certainty that each and every one of you are on mission exactly where you are. It expands our horizons, and three, it sets the agenda. What we're going to talk about next week is discipleship. Because if this whole thing is about God's plan to restore, and God's plan to restore is done primarily through his church, then the most important thing the church does is get people ready for mission. That's our most important task. There are lots of ways that you can do that. It's been proven time and time again that there is no one-size-fits-all plan for discipleship. But I think every church has to have a plan. And so next week we're going to talk about that a little bit. Guys, as we go out today, is our hope that all of creation experiences the oneness that God designed for us to live under the loving, perfect rule of Jesus, our King. Is our mission to save some or to work with God in transforming the world into his vision for what it should be like? Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you today that you have come to show us what perfect oneness could be like. And that you include us in your plan to redeem everything. Not just small parts of life, but literally every part of life is a part of the redemptive plan of Jesus Christ. God, help us to be a church that has a full, robust understanding of the good news that when you came, you, you didn't just came to fix our personal problems. No, you, yes, and so much more. This world one day will be your new kingdom. We want to be a part of that dream and that vision. So give us courage and give us strength and give us wisdom. God, let us enjoy our time as a part of your kingdom plan. We ask for this in Christ's name. Amen.
darkness still stands and great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands and this is my confidence you've never Well, that is Church Online for this week. I hope that you found it meaningful. I hope that you found it helpful. Uh, as always, we want to hear from you. If you're not able to be with us, the greatest way that we can be in connection with each other is either through a, a phone call or an email or connecting with us on social media. We would love to know how we can pray for you. We would love to know how God is working in your life. Uh, and we would just like to be connected to you. So take time to send us a note this week if you can. And we will see you all as soon as possible in the very near future. Bye for now.